But Father, it is our desire that we may understand your word and that you, by your grace, would give us the illumination that can only come through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Left to our own devices and in ourselves, we have no ability to understand spiritual things. But because we are in Christ and you've given us the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and quickens our hearts and our minds, we, by your grace, are able to understand all things. And we pray that you would give to us that understanding today as we begin to study and think about some things that are difficult to comprehend and difficult to assess. We pray that you would give us wisdom and guidance from your Holy Spirit, that he would be our teacher and that we would be students as we learn together in your word. May you be glorified through our understanding of the truth, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, last week we stopped right in the middle of a verse. In fact, it was in the middle of a sentence in the scriptures as we came to chapter 3, verse 6, where we read halfway through verse 6, that we are his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. And we stopped right there at that word, if. And I said to you that that word and this verse is one of those verses that is seized upon by those who believe that you can lose your salvation. And they use this verse and a statement like this, a conditional statement, and one like it down in chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, we have a similar statement there to prove that it is possible for those who have been saved to lose their salvation and to be lost. And I indicated to you that verse 7 and following all the way through the end of chapter 4 is one long warning passage. It is the second of the five warning passages in the book of Hebrew. And these warning passages are, as I said, typically a turn to and appeal to by those who believe it is possible for us to lose our salvation. They appeal to those warning passages because they want to show that if we don't hold fast to our faith, our confidence, our assurance, all the way to the end, that then we will finally be lost. And so we want to assess these warning passages. And uh, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to jump right into it. I want to lay some groundwork for assessing, understanding, and interpreting the warning passages as they are presented in the book of Hebrews. So this is going to take a little bit of time to do that. Second, we're going to look at verse 6, this conditional statement, and the statement that is like it in verse 14. We're going to deal with just those two statements and how do we understand conditional statements. And then I'm going to give you an overview of the warning passage, which goes from chapter 3, verse 7, all the way through the end of chapter uh, 4. So that is a large chunk of material and you can probably guess that we're not going to get through it all in one Sunday, or two Sundays, or three Sundays, but we will get through it, I promise you that. We're going to take and we're going to, we're going to just slowly and methodically deal with the issues that are in the passage, and today we're just going to begin by just laying some groundwork for how we understand the warning passages and what we need to keep in mind. So let's begin with this. These are not easy passages to interpret, and that is true whether you are on in the camp that believes it's possible to lose your salvation or whether you are in the camp that believes it is not possible to lose your salvation. There are issues in all of these warning passages that are conundrums for people on both sides of this issue. It's not like these are Arminian verses that are a slam dunk, a, a go-to verse for those who believe you can lose your salvation, and that those of us who don't believe that stand around the outside and wonder, how is it that we need to twist this and form this to fit my theology? That's not the case at all. There are interpretive issues in all of these passages for, for anybody of any theological stripe. There are issues that need to be dealt with. So these are very difficult passages. And consequently, that's one of the reasons why the book of Hebrews is often neglected in the preaching and life of the modern church. How often as you hear people go through the book of Hebrews? How many times have you had an in-depth study of the book of Hebrews? Not often. I think that 25 or 30 years ago or whenever it was, Dave Kinney Sr. went through the book of Hebrews, and I was a teenager, and I wasn't paying attention to anything in Scripture, only the girls around me at the time. So I wasn't paying attention to that. But it's just you don't, you don't, you don't get a, a thorough study of the book of Hebrews very often because we shy away from it. it is, it's, it's a challenging book. There's a lot of challenging things. And not the least of which are these five warning passages. Second, I think we should point out that we all know people who are on the other side of the aisle, the theological aisle from us. If you're sitting here today and you believe that it's possible for you to lose your salvation, you know somebody who doesn't believe that. You, you obviously do. How do I know that you know somebody? Because you are surrounded by people, most of which would probably say, you cannot lose your salvation right here in this congregation. Now, if you believe that it is impossible for one who is truly saved to lose your salvation, you most certainly know somebody who believes that you can lose your salvation, right? If you don't, that means you swim in some pretty small circles, and you really need to get out more, because there's a, <laughs> that is the bulk of evangelicalism today, that kind of an Arminian approach. So you know somebody who's on the other side of this issue from you, and this is an emotionally charged issue. 
People do not want to hear that little Johnny, who prayed a prayer when he was four and was baptized when he was five, but is today living in hard-hearted, unrepentant unbelief, with no interest in the things of God, is actually an unbeliever. They don't want to hear that. They, they want to believe that little Johnny prayed the prayer, we believe it was sincere, and after all, once saved, always saved, right? That's the hope, that's the confidence. Once saved, always saved. He prayed the prayer, he got in. And they don't want to be told that no, he fits the group of people described in Hebrews chapter 2 and chapter 4 and chapter 6 and chapter 10. That's speaking to him. On the other side of the aisle, people who believe that you uh, cannot lose your salvation, or sorry, that you can lose your salvation, they don't want to hear preaching that suggests it is impossible for a true believer to lose their salvation because they think that such preaching would lead to licentiousness. If you tell somebody, look, once you pray the prayer, you're in like Flynn, and there's no way you can ever lose that. Once you tell them that, they're going to, they're going to go off and sin in all kinds of ways. Such preaching can only lead to apathetic, cool-hearted uh, Christian profession and people sinning and living however they want. After all, we need to every once in a while sort of warm the feet of the people who are professing faith in Christ and remind them at any moment you can slip and fall into the perishment of, of eternal damnation. And if you don't keep, keep people fearing that damnation, then they will might lose their grip on Christ. You want, you want to make sure that they're scared enough to hold on to him for all they've got so that they can get through. Right? And you've got to warn them of the hell to come. So there are people on both sides of this that feel passionately about it. And um, so... No matter what I preach, I'm going to offend somebody, right? So I'm just going to go into what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Let's give some principles of interpretation. How is it that we deal with the warning passages? Let me, let me lay out a, some, a bit of parameters, and this is intended to sort of set the table for understanding all of the warning passages. Here's number one. We affirm, first of all, the Scripture is clear on the subject. It's, it's clear on the subject. I don't think the Scripture is confusing on this. It's not... And this is where people get off the rails right at the very beginning. They'll say something like, well, you know, there are all these verses that say that you cannot lose your salvation. And then there are all these verses that seem to suggest that you can lose your salvation. So maybe God's sort of thrown all of those into the mix just to keep us wondering about it, lest we go off into any extreme. And all that is is another way of saying God himself is really confused on it, and he is unable to communicate the truth without recklessly contradicting himself. That's what that means. We don't believe that. Scripture is clear. The problem is not with the clarity of Scripture on the subject. The problem is with the ability of the reader and the hearer to understand it and to, and to interpret it in light of the surrounding context and not in light of their traditions or previously held beliefs. Second, we would affirm that Scripture is not contradictory in any way. There's ultimately one author to this book, and he is able to communicate without contradicting himself. So we don't have to sort of walk a middle road and say, well, God, it is possible and it is not possible, and we just don't know when which is which. These things are mutually exclusive. Either it is possible for you to lose your salvation, or it is not possible for a truly saved person to lose their salvation. But it cannot be both of those things. So we affirm that Scripture is not contradictory, and so we want to systematize our theology. And there's nothing wrong with having a systematic theology. We want to have a coherent, systematic approach to understanding what is true and to understanding truth. Now, systematic theology is often disparaged in our own day because people say, look, look you guys like you know, Kootenai Community Church, you want to have your, your theology all in a, in a little line. You want to know that this is what I believe and, and keep it nice and tidy, and then there's no love in your hearts. I believe that that is a false dichotomy. I don't think that having good and sound and systematic and, and precise theology is, a, is the opposite of having a love for Christ. If your knowing more truth causes your love to diminish, might I suggest that there's, the problem is not with the truth. The problem might be with you and who it is and what it is that you're loving. We can have passionate affection, but there's no virtue in being passionately affectionate about error. So we want to have systematic theology. We want to make sure that as we're interpreting these passages of Scripture, that we're doing so in the context of the book of Hebrews, in their own immediate context, and in a way that is consistent with other passages of Scripture, so that we bring other doctrines and other passages to bear upon this as a secondary light upon the interpretation of this passage, of the passage itself. So belief about the security of the believer, and this is where it fits into our systematic approach to our theology, Belief about the security of the believer in his salvation is not what we would call a first-order belief. In other words, we don't begin with that and then reason backwards to other doctrines. In a sense, our belief in the security of the believer is a conclusion or an inference that we could draw, even if Scripture was unclear about, about that issue at all. It is an inference or a conclusion that we could draw 
just from what we understand about other doctrines. So I can reason to my belief in the security of the believer. I don't begin with that as a first order doctrine. I can conclude that. And let me show you what I mean. Now, this is not to say that scripture has not revealed the case regarding whether a believer is secure. It has with statements where Jesus said things like, my sheep hear my voice and they come to me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand or my father's hand. The father who gave them to me is greater than all and no one shall snatch them out of my hand or the father's hand. It's John chapter 10. Jesus said in John 6, all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me will I will not cast out. Uh, they will come to me. I will give them eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day. Every last single one who has been given by the father to the son will be raised up on the last day. That is the promise. So that's what scripture reveals about that. But this conclusion that we are secure in our salvation is something that we can, we can be drawn to or we can come to as a, as a matter of conclusion when we systematize the rest of our doctrine. So let me lay out that case for you in, in a quick fashion. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that God is absolutely sovereign. I believe in the precise, perfect, and infallible foreknowledge of God in all things. I believe in the perfection of the work of Christ on the cross. I believe that justification, my righteous standing before God, is on the basis of faith and faith alone. Alone. Not my works. Not my adhering to anything, but by faith alone. I believe in the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, who gives new life, new affections, and new desires, and a new nature to those who believe. I believe in divine election and predestination. I believe in the vicarious, that is, substitutionary nature of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. I believe that he perfectly, fully, and always intercedes perfectly and fully and always for those who are his, for whom he died. I believe that Christ is the builder of God's building, and he is building a perfect building, and he cannot fail. I believe that believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit. I believe that man is dead in his trespasses and sins, and he is unable to respond to the message of the gospel because he is corrupt, and he is an enemy of God, and he is dead. And because he is dead, salvation, faith, and repentance must be gifts that God grants through the regenerating work of his Holy Spirit. I believe that Christ is able to keep those whom the Father gives to him, that he will keep his word, and that he will raise all of them up on the last day, as he has promised in John chapter 6. I believe that eternal life is eternal. I believe that adoption is permanent. And I believe that the propitiation, the satisfaction of the wrath of God that Christ provided through his death on the cross is a full, it is final, and it is a perfect propitiation. From all of that, I can conclude that the one who is saved by Jesus Christ is kept by Jesus Christ perfectly and finally all the way to the end. That is a doctrine that I can conclude from everything I just listed here for you. I believe that one is sa who is safely, uh, one who is fully saved, truly saved is safely saved. I said again, I want who want, believe that one who is truly saved is safely saved. And that is what that kind of an approach is what we are dealing with here in the book of Hebrews. From the book of Hebrews, we find out that the death of Christ was a perfect death, that it fully satisfied all the wrath of God on behalf of those for whom he died, and that having died for them, he now sits at the Father's right hand and intercedes for them constantly, perfectly before the Father's throne, and that he is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to him, that his death is perfect, his work is perfect, and that my salvation, your salvation, rests not in the least bit upon what we do or who we are or how we respond, but upon him and him alone, because his work is perfect. Now, because I believe all of that, I believe that the believer is secure, that eternal life is eternal. And yet we have here in the book of Hebrews these warning passages. So how do we deal with them? Let me lay all of my cards on the table. If you haven't guessed yet, if I've been in any way unclear, I believe in the security of the believer, the perfect and absolute security of those who have believed. So I would affirm that those who have been saved and redeemed by Jesus Christ are kept by him and preserved by him and glorified by him, every last one of them. They must and they will be saved because Christ cannot fail to save even one for whom he shed his blood. He cannot fail to save even one whom the Father has given to him and committed to his care. He cannot fail to save even one who has believed upon him 
whom he has welcomed and given eternal life to. There is not one individual who has been graciously given by the Father to the Son as an act of divine election and predestination whom the Son will lose somewhere along the line, who will perish everlastingly. So I believe in the full security of the believer. I would deny that those who have fallen away from the faith and apostatized were ever believers to begin with. Right? So I affirm the full security of the believer. I deny that apostates were ever believers to begin with. Those who do not persevere to the end are not saints. They may go forward at a meeting. They may raise their hand. Uh, they may come forward at the, at the, to the altar. They may check a box. They may you know, give a motion like this, and the preacher says, uh, if you just pray this prayer, pray this prayer, raise your hand. They may even be baptized. None of those are the evidence of salvation. None of those are. You know what the evidence of salvation is? They persevere to the end. That's the evidence of salvation. Who is it that is saved? The one who endures all the way to the end and does not walk away from Christ. That is the one who is saved. The evidence of salvation is not checking a box and raising a hand or walking an aisle or even being baptized. None of those things is the fruit of salvation in the least. The fruit of salvation is godliness, holiness, and perseverance all the way to the end. So I, though I affirm the security of the believer, I do not affirm any kind of easy believism that says that you can pray like an angel one day and live like a devil the next and have assurance of your salvation. I reject that. And I reject the, the notion that one can check a box and pray a prayer and walk forward at a meeting and even reform outwardly their character and conduct for a short period of time and then totally walk away from the faith and have no interest in the things of God and apostatize and live in hard-hearted, rebellious unbelief and still be considered a believer just because at some previous time they checked a box or walked an aisle or raised their hand or even were baptized. I reject that notion. The evidence of genuine and true salvation is perseverance all the way to the end. So the promises of Scripture settle the weary heart of the true believer. The warning passages of Scripture unsettle the apathetic heart of the make-believer. Did you catch that? That's important. The promises of Scripture are intended to settle the weary heart of the believer. The warning passages, like in Hebrews, are intended to unsettle the apathetic heart of a make-believer. And that's what these passages are for. So having gone through that, let's look now at this. All of that was sort of an introduction. And you can see why I was a little upset that we started late, because here we are. At the time, I should be wrapping up with a conclusion. And, well, I'm just getting into it. You're just sitting there, but I'm just getting into it. Okay, verse 6. Let's understand this conditional sentence. I told you that we needed to lay a bit of groundwork and then look at the conditional sentence in verse 6 and verse 14. And then we would kind of get an overview of the passage. So let's look at this conditional sentence. You'll read in verse 6, But Christ was faithful as a son over his house whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Notice the presence of the word if. Right? We are his house if. You'll notice a similar statement down in verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. The presence of if in both of those conditional sentences seems to suggest that this is a condition that we must do in order to receive what is promised, that is being partakers of Christ or being part of God's house. Now, I would want you to notice two things about both of those passages. Notice that the author is intending to communicate that the people to whom he is writing are genuine and true Christians. I don't doubt that in the least. I'm not going to make the argument that he's writing to a bunch of pagans in the congregation uh, in this passage and that that who is, is who the target is. I don't think that that is the case. I think he is writing to genuine and true believers. And if you're paying attention and thinking through this, then you realize that I just made making my case even more difficult by affirming that he is writing to genuine and true Christians. But I think it is. He's writing to those who are partakers of the heavenly calling, to those who are called holy brethren, to those who are the children of God. He is telling us in verse 6 that, uh, and he speaks of those who are part of the house of God. Remember, that's the spiritual people of God. Uh, through all time, those are the spiritual household of God, that Christ is the builder of that. We are part of that, and he affirms that. We are his house, he says in verse 6. We have become partakers of Christ, a past tense event. We became partakers of Christ. So he's writing to true people, not people on the fringes, not professing Christians, not fake believers, not wolves in sheep's clothing. He is writing to true and genuine Christians in this passage. Okay, so what about the if? What do we do with this if statement? Because it seems to suggest that our being part of the household of God is contingent upon our ability to hold fast to the end. Doesn't it read that way? Whose house we are if, if we hold fast, our confidence, the boast of our hope firm until the end. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast our assurance. It is as if, it is as if he is throwing in this if in the middle of that sentence in order to raise the possibility that those who have once 
latched on to Christ and have believed and been saved might finally perish if they don't maintain their salvation. And this is exactly what an Arminian or somebody who, who rejects the security of the believer, this is exactly what they would say that the passage is teaching, that it is all contingent upon us. They would say that God himself has given us all the grace that is necessary for us to persevere to the end. He's provided everything that we need sort of out there. Second, God has given us sufficient motivation to persevere to the end. He's encouraged us all the way along. He's, he's, and then third, he has warned us about the danger of not persevering. He's provided everything we need. He's given us adequate encouragement, and he has warned us of the danger of not doing it. And now the Arminian would step back and say, but God has not done anything to guarantee or to secure the outcome for any individual whatsoever. All of that rests upon us. If I hold fast, I remain part of his house. If I don't, I fall away and I'm no longer part of his house. As if it is possible to be in the household of God and enjoy the blessings and the benefits of salvation and then to finally fall away and perish because I failed to maintain my belief or I failed to maintain my perseverance or I failed to maintain my love and affection for Christ. That is, what, that is the argument. So how then do we deal with this conditional statement? There are two ways the conditional statements are used in Scripture. One of them is a cause-effect relationship. One of them is to indicate a cause-effect relationship, and that is how the Arminian takes this. You'll notice that in verse 6, we have uh, the main sentence, or the main part of the the, the main clause. That's That's the word I'm looking for. Whose house we are. That's the main part of the sentence, the clause. Whose house we are. We could just rephrase it and say, we are his house. If, and this is the subordinate clause of the sentence, if... We hold fast. We are his house if we hold fast. The main part of the sentence, we are his house. The subordinate or the conditional part of the sentence, if we hold fast. Now, the Arminian would argue, and those who believe you can lose your salvation, they argue this is a cause-effect relationship. The effect is we are his house. The cause of that is us holding fast. So if I hold fast, that causes me to be part of his house. If I stop holding fast, that causes me to be not part of his house. My holding fast causes me to be part of the house. Do you see the relationship? That's a cause-effect relationship. Now, are, uh, are conditional sentences used in Scripture to describe a cause and effect relationship? The answer to that is yes. So here I'm going to give you proof for the Arminian position. Now, you know how this rolls. I'm going to give you proof, and I'm going to very quickly uh, pull it back. But I'm going to argue their case for just a second. Are there conditional phrases in Scripture used to describe this cause and effect relationship? Yes, there are. I'll give you four of them. Leviticus 19.7. Leviticus, that's some good reading, isn't it? Leviticus 19.7, so, and I'm sure, you've, I'm sure you've read this. You're reading through Leviticus 19, and you come across this phrase, and you think to yourself, man, that's, that's great. I remember just, yeah, I remember, Jim, because I read this last week. Leviticus 19.7, so, if it is eaten at all on the third day, it's an offense. It will not be accepted. Now, Leviticus 19 is dealing with peace offerings, and here was the law for the peace offerings. You offer the peace offerings, you could eat it that day, you could eat it the next day, but if you ate it on the third day, it was an offense, and it would be rejected. So, notice the conditional phrase. If it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an offense. Or to put it in the order of our sentence in verse 6, it is an offense if it is eaten on the third day. Eating it on the third day causes the condition, the effect, of it being an offense. Do you see that? Romans chapter 7, verse 2. For if a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. There's a conditional sentence, right? The married woman is bound by her husband if he lives. If he dies, she's released. The one thing, the, sub, so the, the conditional phrase, is the cause of the effect that she is released from the law concerning her husband. Romans 14, 23, speaking of one who eats meat, uh, but his conscience bothers him, Paul writes, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats. He's condemned if he eats. If he doesn't eat, he's not condemned. You see the conditional fr- sentence, if he does this, it causes this. It's a cause-effect relationship. One more, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives. If her husband is dead, she's free to marry whomever she wishes only in the Lord. So the causing of the one, the effect is that she's free to remarry. That is caused when her husband dies in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So there is a cause-effect relationship that is sometimes described in this use of the conditional sentence. Those are examples of the cause and effect nature of some conditional sentences in Scripture, and there are a few others, but I'm going to cut those out for the sake of time. But the question is, is that the only way the conditional phrases, conditional sentences are used in Scripture? And the answer to that is no. There's a second way that conditional sentences, like verse 6 and like verse 14, are used in Scripture. And that is to describe not a cause and effect relationship, but an evidence to inference relationship. Oh, there goes Jim with all the big words again. An evidence to inference, an inference being a conclusion. In other words, 
one part of the sentence points to the conclusion that another part of the sentence is describing. An evidence to inference relationship. So in verse 6, the if we hold fast our confidence to the end is the evidence that points back to the inference or the conclusion, we are his house. We are his house, the conclusion, if the evidence, we hold fast to the end. It is an evidence to inference relationship instead of a cause to affect relationship. So now the question is, does scripture use conditional phrases and conditional sentences to describe an evidence to inference relationship? And the answer to that is yes, lots. Let me give you a few of them. Back to your favorite book of the Bible, the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, 51. And I only bring this up because I gave you one from Leviticus for the, as a, a counterexample. Leviticus 13, 51 says, He shall then look at the mark on the seventh day. Now, this to give you some context, this is in the passages that describe the laws regarding leprosy. Those are the most fascinating of all, right? Scraping off the plaster and cleaning out the house and all that good stuff and the priests in seven days. So this is regarding the, this is regarding the laws concerning leprosy. Leviticus 13.51, he shall then look at the mark on the seventh day. If the mark has spread in the garment, whether in the warp or the woof or in the leather, whatever the purpose for which the leather is used, the mark is a leprous malignancy. It is unclean, okay? Let me break it down. If the mark has spread in the garment, the mark is a leprous malignancy. Now, if is the condition, the evidence. If it has spread, then the conclusion is it is malignant. Is it the spreading of the mark in the garment that makes it a leprously malignant? Or is the spreading of the mark in the garment the evidence that it is malignant leprosy? It is an evidence to inference conditional phrase, conditional sentence. Now a bunch of them from the New Testament. John 8, 31. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. That's an evidence to inference. It's not continuing in his word that makes us his disciples. Us continuing in his word is the evidence that we are truly his. That's what he's saying in John chapter 8. John 15, verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, do we become Jesus' friends by doing what he commands? That's a, con that's, a, that's a cause and effect relationship. No, we do what he commands. That is the evidence that we are his friends. The evidence that I belong to him is my obedience. That's what Jesus is saying. It's not our obedience that makes us belong to him. It is our obedience, which is an evidence of our belonging to him. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8, if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons, right? If you're without discipline, you're illegitimate children. Or let's put it in the order of our sentence here in verse 6, you are illegitimate children, what? If you're without discipline. What is the conclusion? You're illegitimate children. What is the, in, what is the evidence of that? You are without discipline. You look at somebody who sins willfully in their life and they're without the discipline of God, that is the evidence that they do not belong to him because God disciplines the child whom he loves. That's Hebrews chapter 12. So it's an evidence to inference relationship. Another one, James 2, 17. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead. Now, is it the lack of works that makes faith dead or is the lack of works the evidence of a dead faith? The lack of works is an evidence of a dead faith. 1 John 2, verse 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Is it our love of the world that... Is the that causes the love of the Father not to be in us? Or is our love of the world the evidence that the love of the Father is not in us? You see, these conditional sentences are used as an evidence to inference. I would argue that the exact same thing is happening here in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. What is the inference? We are his house. What is the evidence of that? If we hold fast to the end. Consequently, if you do not hold fast to the end, what does that mean? You're not his house. This is what John says in 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us because they were not of us. If they were of us, they would have remained with us. But the fact that they went out shows they were never of us to begin with. Because they depart, that shows that they were not true and genuine believers. The fact that if they were genuine and true believers, they would hold fast to the end. They would stay with us all the way to the end. But John says they left. That is the evidence that they were not of us. Okay? We are his house. That is the inference. That's what we can conclude. The evidence of that is that we remain faithful and hold on, and hold fast, even to the very end. And then the same thing would be true down in chapter 3, verse 14. Look at that conditional phrase. We have become partakers of Christ. Notice this past tense. We have already become partakers of Christ. This is not describing somebody on the fringes who's sort of outside and, and, and has no real connection to Christianity, who falls away. This is describing somebody who is a genuine and true believer. We have become, past tense, partakers of Christ, genuine Christian. What is the evidence that one has truly been made a partaker of Christ's past tense, they hold fast their assurance firm till the end. It's an evidence to inference conditional sentence.
So I would affirm in chapter 3 that this is describing true and genuine believers. This is a warning given to them. But these conditional sentences do not describe a cause-effect relationship. They describe an evidence-to-inference relationship. What is the evidence that we belong to him? We remain faithful all the way to the end. Trials come, temptations come, tribulations come, difficulties come. And those things may shake us, they may rock us, but ultimately they do not push us out of his grip. We remain his because he holds on to us. We hold on to him because by his grace we are his. And that is the evidence of our salvation. The evidence of conversion is not walking an aisle and raising your hand, praying a prayer, or being baptized. The evidence of your conversion is will you may remain faithful all the way to the end. Those who have walked away from Christ are just giving evidence that they are not his, and they never were. That's not somebody who loses their salvation. That's somebody who pretends to be one of us for a period of time. And for some people, it can be very convincing. They can look a lot like us for a long time. And then they walk away. You scratch your head and say, did he lose his salvation? No, no. It just took longer for that sow having washed to return to its wallowing in the mire. For that dog having departed for a period to go right back to its vomit. Because salvation is a change of nature, a change of character, a change of affections, and all of that, because it is so fundamentally a change, those who have been changed will never go back to it. But you can take a sow, and you can wash her up and move her out of the pig pen, but when you open up that gate, where is she going? Right back into the mud. Right? You can take a dog and drag him off of his vomit, but you let go of him, what is he going to do? He's going to return back to his vomit. Why? Because it is in the nature of the sow to wallow in the mud. It is in the nature of the dog to eat its own vomit. Sometimes I preach messages that make you hungry for lunch, and other times I, I preach messages that just make you think, you know, I might start my fasting today. So this is an inference to evidence statement in verse 6. It's not a, it's not a conditional sentence that, that shows that one thing, holding fast, causes the other. Us belong to his house. Rather, us holding fast is the evidence that we do indeed truly belong to his house. Notice he says that we hold fast our confidence and our hope firm until the end. Our confidence is in Christ as Christians. We have confidence in him as the builder of the house, him as the savior, the faithful high priest who intercedes for us, who has made propitiation for our sins. That is our confidence. And hope here is not the act of hoping. It is the thing in which we hope. And, and there's plenty of things just in what we've covered so far in the book of Hebrews uh, that, that gives us the content of what it is that we are hoping for. We are looking forward to that one who has made purification for sins and sat down at the Father's right hand, who himself is coming to establish his kingdom, surrounded by the worship of angels, to restore the dominion that was lost at the fall and give it back to us and to bring all things under subjection to himself and then give to us, the heirs of the kingdom, all that is his by, de by designation of the Father. That is the hope. That is what we're waiting for. The true believer will hold on to that all the way to the very end. Doesn't mean at times that he might feel like Asaph in Psalm 73 where his feet begin to slip and he starts to question. It doesn't mean that we are free from doubt. It doesn't mean that we're free from fear. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily always free from anxiety. But we are always free from the possibility of falling into everlasting damnation and perishing away from Christ. That We are free from that. We don't have to worry about that. And so we are encouraged to hold tight to him and hold fast to him. And the true believer will do so all the way to the very end. Now let's get an overview quickly of the warning passage itself. This is, as I said, the, the uh, second of five warning passages. This is the longest of all five of them, 572 words. It is 33% longer than the next largest one, which is in chapter 10. So this is going to take a little bit of while to work through as we do so methodically. And there's nothing to fear by the details of the passage. And as we work through it, you'll see what he is, the argument that he is making, and you're going to see that it doesn't overthrow any kind of confident belief in the security of the believer. There is an Old Testament background to this passage, and it is the account of the generation that wandered in the wilderness because on the cusp of going into the promised land in the book of Numbers, <clears throat> the 12 spies came back with a report of the giants and, and all of the fortifications in the land, and they panicked and did not believe and demonstrated their unbelief and their unfaithful and wicked hearts by not trusting what, that what God said was true. And so they turned back from that, and as a punishment, they were uh, sentenced to wander in the wilderness, and all of them, that entire generation, to die off over the course of 40 years. And so that's the background for this. Now, the, the, that account is sort of reminisced about in Psalm 95, which is the quotation that you see in verses 7 through 11 of chapter 3. That is a quotation from Psalm 97, or sorry, 95 verses 7 through 11. There's a the, the parallel uh, verse numbers there, but that's just an observation. Okay, so Psalm 95 recounts or tells the story, worships around that, that, that episode in the life of the nation of Israel. That, that incident with the children of Israel in the wilderness is, serves as a background in this passage. It serves as a cautionary tale 
to believers today of what it means to demonstrate an unbelieving and unfaithful heart and what that looks like amongst the people of God. And I would encourage you to do two things in the coming week. Read Numbers 13 and 14. That's the account itself. And Psalm 95, those three passages. If you read that a couple of times over the course of the next week, when you get together, to get together next weekend, you'll have the background necessary to kind of follow along. Chapter 4 might be familiar, with you, be familiar to you because of the mention of God's rest in verse 1. Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. So then we're going to have to deal with the question in chapter 4, what is that rest of God? What does it mean? Uh, how do we enter it? Uh, what are the implications of that for us today? You'll see in verse 11 that he wants us to enter in. He says, concluding that discussion of God's rest, therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. And so he wants us to understand what that rest is and to enter into that rest. And there is a danger that having thought that we have entered into that rest, that we might not have actually done so, and that those who have not done so and have not entered that rest then would fall away. And he wants us to hold fast to that. You'll see it in verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So this warning passage is bracketed by, by that command to hold fast. We're his house if we hold fast. In the middle, we are partakers if we hold fast. And at the end, therefore, let us hold fast. He wants us to hold fast. He is encouraging us to hold fast. And what is the evidence that we have held fast? That we continue. Uh, or what is, the, what is the conclusion from holding fast? That we are his, that we belong to his house, and that we are partakers of Christ. This passage has a lot to say about the heart and the condition of the heart. Uh, six out of the 11 times that the word heart occurs in the book of Hebrews, it occurs in this warning passage. He is focusing upon the condition of the heart. We are warned. You can see back in chapter 3, verse 7, actually. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. And all the way through this passage, he is dealing with heart issues. And we see what a hard heart looks like. It's the children of Israel in the wilderness. That's the hard heart. And we are warned. That is a cautionary tale for us. And we are encouraged to not harden our hearts and to not let our hearts be hardened. So how is it then that a believer is to respond to these warning passages? I'll give you the response of a believer. I'll give you the response of an unbeliever. An unbeliever reads the warning passages and he says, here's what God has warned me about. He has, he has cautioned me to not do this. He has cautioned me of these dangers. Now, in obedience to my Lord, because of what he has done for me, I understand that I'm safe, but I'm going to stay as far away from these things that he has warned me about as I possibly can, because I want to obey him. I want to demonstrate my faithfulness, my fidelity to his calling because of what he has done. So he has warned me about these things. I'm going to stay away. And he has warned me about a hard heart. I'm going to make sure that I try and keep my heart nice and soft. He has warned me about disobedience. I'm going to make sure that I try and obey him, that I strive to obey him. I pursue obedience. He's warned me about unholiness. I'm going to make sure that I pursue holiness. The, un, the believer looks at the warning passages and stays as far away from them as he possibly can. Now, and against, away from those things as he possibly can. The result of that is that the warning passages themselves serve as the barricades that keep the children of God safe. An unbeliever reads the warning passages and he says, yeah, it doesn't apply to me. And right across the barricade he goes. Thus evidencing that he is not, does not belong to Christ. So the warning passages are like the, uh, on, a to on a high mountain road, the, the concrete barricades that they put up along the edge of the road that they're to keep you safe. A believer sees those warning passages and stays away from them. I'm going to stay inside. I'm going to hug the inside so I don't want to get close to that. There's obviously something over there. And he, and he drives that way. A non-believer just totally disregards the barricade and goes right through the barricade and off the cliff. The warning passages are one of the means by which God keeps his people safe from falling away. They become the means of that. Because the believer reads the warning passage and says, I don't want that. I want Christ. I'm make sure that I'm firmly in him. So I will evaluate to make my own calling and election sure. I will check to see if I am truly indeed in the faith. I will, I will judge my fruits by what I see in Scripture. I'm not going to rest in some false, uh, false standard of assurance. I want to stay safe. I don't want to stay safe in the arms of Christ. And that is where I want to be, and that's where I want to rest. And the believer wants to rest there and stays there. He doesn't try and push the boundaries. The unbeliever goes past the warning passages. The believer, for the believer, the warning passages are the means of his preservation. Catch that. For the believer, the warning passages are one of the means of our preservation. We are kept safe. Because God has given us those warning passages. I understand that for today, a lot of this has been more of an intellectual exercise than it has necessarily an emotional or a spiritual or affectionate exercise. My only prayer and hope is that this has 
laid some groundwork and that the Holy Spirit will use this to inflame your own love for Christ and to keep you safe in his harm, uh, arms, uh, away from harm, and thus prove that you are part of the family of God. Lord willing, we'll start next week with verse 7, and we'll start working our way through this warning passage. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you that you have been so good and kind to us to preserve those who are yours and to keep us by your grace. We thank you that our salvation rests not upon our, our grasp or our grip upon Christ, but upon uh, his grip on us. We thank you for the warning passages that uh, highlight for us the errors of those who will plunge past them, and we pray that you would use them as a means to strengthen our own hearts and to cause us to examine ourselves and to be diligent to make our calling and election sure. May you be glorified in preserving and keeping us. If our salvation depended upon our strength or our abilities, then we would have fallen away the very day that we trusted Christ. We thank you that it does not. So we rest in him. and We are grateful for a high priest who intercedes for us even now. Strengthen us in our, uh, encourage us in our hearts and in our faith and in our walk with Christ that we may give to him the honor that he is due. We ask this in his name. Amen.